Have you ever been on a country road that had a lot of bumps, but you have to drive kind of fast, and you drive down that road, and you, you just are experiencing this for a long time, or, or maybe it's like Highway 80 if you've driven across the country, and you spent hours in your car, and you go to get out of the car, you have to fuel up, you have to stop to go to the bathroom, you know how it is, you're on a long trip, and you get out of the car, and suddenly you're like, this doesn't feel right. The world still feels like it's moving. You can feel those bumps. Or, or maybe you're one of those people who goes to the gym and you've worked out on a treadmill while you're watching TV and you're running, right? And you're watching TV and you're just running and running. And then you get off of that treadmill and you walk around and all of a sudden you're going, this doesn't feel right. The world is moving and I, I can't stop it. This is kind of what happened when the disciples, the apostles, and Mary when they lost Jesus on, on Good Friday, when he died and went in the tomb, their world shattered and stopped and things went weird and they were on this ride for a long time and they had not made sense of it. They had not even begun to make sense of it. When the one they thought was going to overthrow the Roman Empire died, was buried, put in a tomb, and they came... That is, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb that first morning and, and said, where is he? Well, he's risen, right? Where, where is he? What, what happened? And she runs and she tells them. Well, this morning we're going to talk about rise up. This idea of not just is Jesus risen, but in some sense we also join him in that rising from the dead. And so this morning's title is Rise Up. And this is in our theme, of course, for the whole year of love. I want to encourage you to, to pay attention to how this story unfolds. We're just going to walk back through this story and talk about some of the crazy little details that you might have missed. As we begin, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing of being here, of joining you in this time. God, move in our hearts. Open our ears. Open our eyes. Let us see. Father, forgive us. Bless us that we might hear your words again. God, may I speak what you wish, and may we hear, may we all hear what you wish. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. So, of course, we're in John 20, verses 1 through 23. It's a long section, but we're just going to kind of walk back through that story. And early on, the first day of the week, the first day, the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that she had, or, or that, I'm sorry, saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Mary Magdalene, alone in the dark, witnesses the empty tomb. She is alone. She is in the dark. It's a little strange, isn't it? A woman by herself goes off into a cemetery into a place of the dead, it says, I, I need to take care of my Lord. But then the tomb is, is open already, and things are strange. So, so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one, the one Jesus loved. We know that is John more than likely, right? He's, he's the one who wrote this all down. This is his gospel. The one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. She's running. She's running. So Mary Magdalene brings the chaotic news to the apostles. She, she just, she's just running though. Running is a strange thing. Did you, you know Mary Magdalene in this gospel, the gospel of John, she doesn't show up until at the cross. And then... She shows up running from the tomb. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now that's, a, that's another curious thing. They're running. You know, there's more running in these few verses than there is in the rest of the Gospels. There's a lot of busy running. They are running. Have you ever run like your life depended on it? Have you ever been in fear, not sure what happened? Maybe you heard some news and you had to get home and you take off running. 
Have, have you ever thought, oh no, what happened? You heard some scream from the backyard and you run through the house because your child is out there. Your friend falls and you don't know whether they're going to get up or not and you're running to see them because they fell out of a tree or something, right? Have you ever been running and just like, what's going on? Peter and John run to examine her crazy story, right? They're just, they're taking off running. This is, this is strange. Grown men don't run in this time period. Nobody exercised <laughs> like, like that. No, nobody just took off running. There, there, there had to be like something else going on. So then he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Now, John was likely much younger than Peter, and Peter was older and brasher, and he was the leader of the group. And, and when Peter shows up, he just runs on in. He just, he, what's going on? I'm, I'm, I'm in there. But John first looks in and sees the strips of linen lying there. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still laying or lying in its place, separate from the linen. It was in its place. It was just where it was supposed to be if Jesus was in those clothes. The grave was empty, so were the grave clothes. They were, they were empty. In fact, there was a, a, a tomb that got sealed up and hidden somewhere around the time of AD 60, and it wasn't discovered until recently. And, and when they opened it all up, they could see somehow that the, the linens were still there. The cloth was still there. What was inside it, though, was only bones. Everything else had rotted away. And so it was just where it was supposed to be. It was kind of like a balloon deflated and just stayed put. And so, but, but there were no bones inside it. And there's no body inside it. There's no one in the cloths. The clo what's going on? How, how do they deal with this? Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, you know, John, the one that was loved, also went inside. He saw and believed. What does, what, John believes? What does that mean? What does it mean that John believes? What, what, is, he, what is he saying? I mean, does he believe that Jesus is alive? Does he believe that the, the tomb is empty? Does he believe that somebody stole the body? Do, what, what's going on? And then they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. So it seems that he maybe didn't believe that Jesus was alive again. Maybe he was just going, well, it's empty. <laughs> where he went, we don't know. What happened? We're not sure. So they don't get it. They're lost. They're clueless. They're, they're, they're just frustrated. They're not sure what happened. Did they walk? Did they run back? Did they go, well, I guess that's true, but this is weird. Can you imagine the discussion they had going back to the others? What do we tell them? Well, we saw the, the cloths, the grave clothes. We, we, we don't know what to make of it. We don't understand it, but we believe her. <laughs> that Mary, you know, strange thing. In this time period, women could not be witnesses in court. They were considered unreliable. <laughs> but she's the witness, and she tells them. So they have to go check it out, and then they go back and tell them, yeah, I guess, yeah, you know, that's what happened. We don't understand it. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. Has she been there the whole time? Did she run back with them? Did she kind of mope back? I don't I, What was she? When did she get there? I mean, she had to leave to go tell them, and then she had to come back, but she's outside the tomb crying. Have you spent much time crying? Do you think this was an ugly cry? One of those really awful ones where there's snot and, the, and everything's coming out and it's going down, and she's like, I don't know what and she can't talk. Or do you think it was just like a weeping and like the persistent like tears just flowing, not making sense of it? I'm lost, I'm clueless, I don't understand. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. Didn't she, wasn't she already in the tomb before? Why is she going back in there? Did something change? And saw two angels in white. That's what changed. Seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Mary Magdalene, an angel she barely notices. 
I mean, did you pay attention to that the first time through this? She, like, doesn't pay attention to them. She's like, oh, yeah, okay, some people are in there. Some angels are in there. Some, what's going on? And she's crying. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? There is no fear not. You know, everywhere else in the Bible, when angels show up, they say, fear not. Here, they don't say that. I'm thinking she wasn't afraid because she didn't recognize they were angels. <laughs> she just looked at them and went, strange. Are you Peter and John? Why are you in here? What's going on? And they look at her and say, why are you crying? And she responds, they have taken away my Lord. And I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Once again, she's clueless. She has no ability to see. Her eyes are closed. Mary Magdalene meets Jesus and doesn't recognize him. Is she blind? Are her eyes not open? I mean, there were two angels. There's Jesus. Like, this is a big deal. She's missing it all. Why? He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Same question. Who is it you are looking for? So same question, plus you seem lost or that you have lost someone. <laughs> you, you are not in your right mind. You can't think straight. Can I help you? And then, thinking he was the gardener, <laughs> thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. A woman is going to carry a man's body. <laughs> I will go get him. Wherever you have taken him, I'm willing. I, I, will, I, will, I will find him and bring him back here. Somebody has stolen this body. The gardener, well, we jumped ahead there. The, we're jumping behind there. The gardener, echoes of Genesis is the question. Is this echoes of Genesis? Is something going on? So here's the thing. Echoes of Genesis is this. It is the first day of of the week. You might call it the eighth day. It is also darkness. There's a lot of darkness. Did you notice that at the beginning? And, and chaos. Things aren't going right. They're chaotic. They're crazy. And eyes that can't see. Something isn't right. What is this Echoes of Genesis all about? So Jesus said to her, Mary, called her name. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Now, here's the thing. If somebody calls your name, it's kind of weird sometimes, right? If you're out in the middle of public, right, just, just out for the day, and somebody calls your name from a crowd, what does that do to you? S snap your head and you go, what's going on here, right? You're like, hey, my wife and kids happened to be down at the um, Ventura Harbor the other day. And uh, some friends of ours that we knew in China had happened to come through as they were camping in Santa Barbara. Bumped into them. Said, oh, hi. <laughs> uh, uh, and see, the thing is, the normal reaction is that when somebody calls your name that you're not expecting, you forget their name, right? <laughs> you're you're kind of clueless and lost, and you're not sure what's happening. And you're like, I know you. Where do I know you from? I, for me, my whole m mind, my whole brain just blanks. I, I lose it, and I'm like, I know you. You're a good friend, I'm sure. Uh... How can we get around this that I don't remember your name or where I know you from because I am spacing right now. I have no clue what's happening. <laughs> There's been people that I dated. I went to introduce them and forgot their name. There, there's been people that I've known for a long time and I, I meet them in public somewhere and they call my name and I'm just blank. But here, Mary's already been blanked. She's already been spaced out, right? She's already been mourning and grieving. And I imagine she's been grieving since Friday. 
I imagine this is not the beginning of her tears. I imagine this has been going on for the weekend, and her mind is cloudy. Have you ever spent a weekend crying? Your brain is not clear. But then the one you love, the one you're looking for, calls your name. And suddenly, <gasps> everything is like, whoa, this is weird. It's, it's, like, it's, it's like you've been hit with a bolt of lightning, and you wake up. It's like you've touched the switch, and you got shocked. It's, it's like you took that 9-volt battery and stuck it on your tongue, and you went, <laughs> right? And you're, you're awake now. And you go, oh, my. So imagine Jesus calls your name. Imagine he says, Greg, Jody, Jamie, Debbie. Imagine Jesus calls your name right now, and he wakes you up. What happens? What do you see that you haven't seen? What, what changes happen in your life that you... That you, that you missed before. Your eyes are now opened. You, you can see clearly. You, you understand things you've never understood. You say, ah, I see now. And, and this again is, is echoes of Genesis. Because you'll remember that the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, but in a negative way. This is in a positive way. And Jesus says, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene is sent with a message for Jesus' brothers. Did you see that? Jesus has never before, never before said brothers to the apostles. Never. And did you see that? That Mary, again, is sent with a message. Do you know what apostle means, actually? It means messenger, one who is sent. And Mary is sent with a message for his brothers to your God and my God. I am going to go and, and, you know, get ready for that. Wow. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. Do you think she ran this time? I think she ran again. I think she took off running. And I have seen the Lord. I did. I saw him. And she told them that he had said these things to her. So she then tells the story again. Like, hey, I, I know I was just with you guys. And I ran and I ran and I'm running again. And I'm out of breath. And I've got to tell you what happened. And she tells the story. On the evening of that first day of the week. Again, echoes of Genesis. The first day. When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, because now they're thinking, oh my goodness, you remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Do you remember that time when he raised Lazarus? They wanted to kill Jesus, and they wanted to kill Lazarus, and now they're going to want to kill us, and then we're all in trouble. Oh my goodness, we got to hide. Lock the doors. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Oh, there, there's the fear not, right? There's the, hey, don't be afraid. Okay, calm down. It's okay. Shh, it's all right. I'm here. It, it's true. I, I'm with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. Like he came among them, and, and then he had to say, hey, look, it's, it's me. See? See here? See, see this right here? <laughs> I'm Jesus. <laughs> and they went, oh, it's you. <laughs> wow. This is amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. Again, Jesus he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. <gasps> There's that message of being sent again. They are all being sent all of them. All of them are being told, you remember how I kept telling you about my father sending me here and you weren't really sure what that meant? But now you get it. Your eyes are open and you are now sent. You, you're going. You're going to go. And when you go, my goodness, what will happen? 
And with that, he breathed on them. And in the time of COVID, we don't do this necessarily, but (laughs) he breathed on them. (sighs) Receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was breathed out and breathed in. Can you imagine all the disciples, the apostles sitting around, and Jesus goes, receive the Holy Spirit. (sighs) And then they all go, (sighs) I'm keeping that breath, aren't I? I've got that. I'm going to hold on to that. I want the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you want the Holy Spirit? If I could breathe it on you like that, my goodness, I would do it. I would say, oh, please receive it. But you've already been given it, haven't you? In your baptism, didn't you die to yourself? And, and you came out of the water and you lived for Christ? And if you haven't done that, well, my goodness, why haven't you? There, there is new life to be had. There is the Holy Spirit to be received. I, I, I want that. Give it to me by all means, right? If you forgive anyone's sins, this is a weird verse. What is this about? Their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. This is where our story ends for the day. What is this? This is craziness. Don't you remember? Only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Why is he saying to them now, you can do it too? What is this? It's madness. That's what it is. They're not, they're not really going to forgive sins, are they? they? They can't really do that. That's only God's job. You, you remember Jesus was, was nearly thrown off a cliff or, or stoned to death or, or dragged out of town. I mean, something horrendous was going to happen to him when he said, no, 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 I can forgive sins. And they went, oh, this is blasphemy, blasphemy. How dare you? So God's mission is now their commission. They have, been, they have been joined to the cause. And God's mission all along has been forgiveness. But it may be bigger than you think, greater than you think. It, it might be a, a bigger deal than what we give it credit for. We talk about the cross, and we talk about the empty tomb, and we, we say how wonderful it all is. But why? What's the ultimate purpose of that? What what is it all about? It's echoes of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, we are told that we are the image bearers of God. And in that, it says that we are the icons or the idols of God. And you might say, we're not idols. But yes, we are. We are the representation of God to the world. In the beginning of Genesis, that was our commission. That was what we are taught to do. That was the first and greatest thing spoken of us, that we will be the representation of God to the world. Our forgiveness, our forgiveness is not just a simple thing. It is putting us back into the garden, reminding us that we are the priests and priestesses, that we are the the image bearers, that we are the ones representing our God to the world. And in that, it tells us that when we make an idol of anything, that is our greatest sin. Because we have essentially lowered our own value. We have removed ourselves. And we have put something else in our place. We have said, this thing, this money, This power, this fame, this family, this joy, temporary, temporary happiness, this thing, this my family, my wife, my husband, my children, what what is it that is so important that it should replace your value as God's image to the world and instead you bow down and worship it? That is an idol. And when we take that idol and we say, no, 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 this is most important in my heart and in my life, we have just devalued ourselves. We have just robbed ourselves of the the essential nature of what it means to be human. The greatest thing that we are in this world is the image bearer of God. And when we do that well, There are no idols in our lives. There is nothing that we bow down and worship except for God alone. That is the echoes of Genesis in this text. 
that we have to lay down our idols. Dear ones, dear children, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, lay down the idols. Give them up. Whatever it is you've put in higher regard than God, than God's image within you, whatever it is that you're holding on to, lay it down. Lay it down. Take up that mantle again of Genesis chapter 1. Be the image bearer of God. Be the one representing him to the world. Be the one living for God. We come to the end of the message, the faith challenges. And we just remember that this is my hope and prayer for you, that if it fits, praise the Lord. If it doesn't, you can always say, ah, I'll try something else. But I ask you to try something else. Find a way to put this on. Find a way to live this out. Find a way to say, no, 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 I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit for more because you have the Holy Spirit, right? So, number one, represent God. Here you are, not representing God. Here you are, normal. (laughs) Here you are, a plain, generic human being who's not really doing what he's supposed to be doing. Here you are, representing God. Because God is within you, outside of you, and you are glowing, if you will. You are on fire, if you will. You You are saying, I am the image bearer of God. I represent God to this world. And I take that job seriously. It's because of that that I know who I am. It's because of that that I find meaning and purpose in this life and that I I can go through hardships and, and trials and temptations and difficulties and whatever it might be and I can live in a way that says, no, 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 I know, I know who I am. I know a Genesis 1 of who I am. I am the image bearer of God and there is no idol that I will bow down to. There is nothing I will put in place of God or myself in that position. I, I have been chosen by God to represent him to the world. Number two, rise up. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Pick it up. Pick it up and walk. Don't put it down. Take that cross. Think about Think about the apostles. They're hiding in a locked room, afraid of the Jewish leaders. And from that day forward, they rose up and they said, no, 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 bring it on. Stone me, kill me, whatever you want to do, I don't care. My life is for Jesus. I know he rose from the dead and I have risen as well. I know what it means that I do not need to fear any man. I have no fear in this world. I live fully engaged as God's representative to the people around me. Rise up. Won't you? Won't you rise up? Won't you take up your cross and follow Jesus? Recognizing your life is not about you anymore. It's about him. And third, live courageously. Well, I don't have any special uh, pretty picture for that. (laughs) But actually, I have this prayer a prayer we've been praying, a prayer you should know well, even if you haven't been here with us. This is a prayer that everybody knows. It's, it's the Our Father. It's the, it's the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. It's the prayer that many people recite on a regular basis. And I encourage you to recite it daily because it reminds us whose we are and what we're about, that this is no longer a, a trivial matter, that my life has incredible meaning because it's about the kingdom of God coming now. Well, it's, it's already, but it's not yet. It's here, but it, it's not yet here fully because the whole world hasn't come under his control, right? The devil is still out there lurking around, seeking who he can devour and who he can destroy. And yet you are the image bearer of God who has no reason to fear because you know whose you are and who you are. And you know why you're here. To make his name great. To love him. That's that's who we are. That's our identity. Live courageously. Pray with me if you will. Our Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God, as we continue to pray, God, I ask that you would put people's hearts on fire. That you would change all of our hearts. That this city would be caught ablaze by you. That we would see your Holy Spirit being breathed in and out and throughout this this nation. God, that this world would be undone and remade. That your will would be done here, now. That we would live in a way that honors you. We would recognize what you have gifted us with, your Holy Spirit. That we are the image bearers of God. That we are the chosen people of God. That you have put us in a beautiful place with a beautiful purpose. God, let us understand what it means to take on the challenge of forgiving others. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, God. And help us to forgive. Help us to be gracious. Help us also to recognize that when we proclaim the life, the resurrection, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that we recognize that some will reject that. And in essence, they are saying, my sin, I will keep it. I do not want to get rid of it. It's precious to me. I I, I like my idols. God, we do not want them to keep them. God, we pray that you would release the idols from the people around us and from ourselves. God, live in us like never before. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. If you need the prayers of the church, if there's any way that we can bless you, if there's any way we can help you, if there's any way that we can help you to live out the resurrection, won't you let us know?